No, happy to be up here. Happy to be up here. I'm happy to get started here in Purdue. Um, and I kind of want to today just kind of go over a little bit of what we saw this last year and then also some some of the research um, that I was involved with um, this year as well. So Bob uh, Nielsen and, and Jim Camerato have been doing a lot of sulfur work recently. Uh, they kind of tied me into that this year. And then uh, it's kind of some stuff that I hope to keep keep doing on in the future. Um, but to get started here, I don't know if I can get a laser pointer here. Um, just my email here. So my email, djquinn at purdue.edu. Um, feel free to email me anytime. Uh, I always tell folks, give me a call, give me an email anytime if you have any questions. Uh, my website, the kernel.info is my website. I put that website together before I got here um, at Purdue. It's just a, just an avenue for us to, you know, share the different articles that I write, you know, the research information I'll have in the future. Um, I like to share a lot of articles from those around us, um, you know, contact information from a lot of folks at Purdue, um, USDA information, weather information, and so on. I'm always trying to add everything I can to that website and, you know, as I get up and rolling here at Purdue, we're just going to keep updating about every week or so um, and adding as much information as we can um, down the road. Um, Twitter, too. I'm sure you all love Twitter um, and use Twitter all the time. But if you are, um, just another avenue um, for pushing out information. Um, but I'll go ahead and get started. I hope you all enjoyed the the uh, um, weather today. I did see some some videos of folks that had planters in the fields um, today, I'm sure down in southern Indiana and parts of Kentucky, there was plenty of folks that had their planters at least out of the sheds and probably into the fields. I know this this weather gets us all um, raring to go for spring. So I want to share a little bit about 2021. So this year, um, this last past year for corn production in the state of Indiana was, you know, a very good year. You think about the areas in southwest Indiana, southern Indiana, um, talked to a lot of folks that had, you know, some of the best corn yields uh, we ever seen. Um, so I was like sharing this graph, just looking at, you know, Indiana average corn yields throughout history. It's pretty interesting to look at it, you know, how things have changed throughout the years. You look at when they started tracking, you know, back in the mid 1800s, you know, corn, corn yields kind of hovered around 30, 40 bushels per acre for about 70 years. Um, and then they started increasing. You think about when hybrid corn started coming in, you know, synthetic fertilizers and herbicides and so on. And, and recently, we're on about, you know, we gain about two bushels per acre per year, um, which is which is pretty good, pretty steady linear yield increase. Um, and I highlighted 2021. So Indiana state record yield average this year. So 195 bushels per acre. That's about 10 percent above yield trend. So we track this trending yield every year and see where we're at um, compared to that trend yield. Uh, you look at the state of Kentucky, too. State of Kentucky was 192 bushels per acre, which is phenomenal for that state. Um, so just kind of those portions of both Southern Indiana and Kentucky had really good years uh, when it comes to corn production. So state of Indiana uh, predicted state average yield. So you look at that trend yield, we predicted be right around 177 bushels per acre, but we're at 195 bushels per acre. Um, so state record yield average, you know, me being my first year, I always think that's kind of cool. Um, maybe I'll, I, I try to tell myself I have a little bit of credit with that. I'm not sure. Maybe it's, it's setting the bar too high uh, my first year, but 195 bushels per acre, just a lot of really good corn um, across the state, especially in the southwest, the southern portions of the state. So the question is, is why? Why do we have such really good corn yields um, across the state? And number one that stood out to us was condition, condition of the corn crop. Um, this graph right here is just looking at what percentage of Indiana corn rates good to excellent throughout the year. So the USDA will rate by county good to excellent ratings for corn. And what we see is 2021 is this red line here. And that red line hovered right about 70, 75 percent good to excellent corn really throughout the entire year. Um, and that's that's really good. So you start seeing those USDA reports, you start seeing those numbers good to excellent, you know, 70 to 75 percent. Uh, we're, we're expecting a pretty good corn crop when those numbers hover throughout the entire year. Uh, we looked at how does this compare to years in the past, too. So record yields, you know, above average trend yield years in the past. So 18 was the last year we had a state record yield in the state of Indiana, about 16, 14, 13, and 04. 
2021 is is very consistent with those years. Um, you look at the percent above that yield trend. I think this, I might have forgot to change this number. I think it's actually upwards around 10% this year. Um, but it, it's pretty consistent with those really good years we had. So across the board, there's really good condition ratings, just a, a great corn crop uh, throughout the entire state of Indiana um, this year that led to that state record yield average. So again, it's, it's why. Why did we have such good corn yields um, in the state of Indiana? And number one is probably is weather. Uh, we looked at both precipitation in the state and also temperature in the state. Um, so this is a temperature map or a precipitation map for the state of Indiana. And this is specifically in June and July uh, for the state of Indiana. And this dark green area here, this darker green is about 125% of normal precipitation. This green area here, lighter green, about 100% of normal precipitation. A little spot here in the center part of the state that was about 75% of precipitation. Think about corn, especially in the months of July, some of those just absolute critical periods for that state, for that corn crop. Think about tasseling, pollination, you know, just that short window where if we had issues in when it comes to getting too dry or getting too hot, they can really throw off some of those corn yields and really hurt some of that, you know, that kernel set and also early kernel fill. Uh, but overall, we had really good precipitation, really good soil moisture conditions during those critical periods of that corn plant's life. Look how that compares to temperature. So this graph, this um, figure here on the right is just showing temperature, same kind of time period between J June and July, especially this kind of lighter tan area means we're about one degree above normal. This gray area means we're about right at normal for temperature. So across the board, think about those critical periods of that corn plant's life, you know, pollination, kernel set, early grain fill, just had really good soil moisture. We had really good temperatures as well. We didn't get too hot and we didn't get too dry. Typically when that happens, we really see instances of having really, you know, setting up that corn crop to have a really good yields um, and finish out the season strong. And this is what we saw. You know, we we have research trials um, really across the entire state of Indiana, and we pull ear samples from every single one of our, our research trials across the state of Indiana at harvest. And I would say 95 to 100 percent of the ears we pulled in those trials look like this. Um, I wish I could pull ears out of research trials and just farms in general that look like this every single year. Uh, we just had excellent kernel set. You know, we had really good kernel fill uh, period or conditions too. But you look at minimal tip back, this excellent kernel set, just not many issues when it comes to pollination issues. You know, not missing kernels or jumble kernels or anything like that. Just, just really good kernel set conditions across the state um, in 2021. And this is really driven by adequate moisture and temperature, specifically during pollination. You know, corn, that period is really critical and it's only about, you know, seven to 14 days when that R1 or that tassel period and that pollination is occurring. So having adequate moisture and temperature during that period is just so important uh, for setting that corn crop up for really good yields uh, to finish out the season. Now, we did have some issues um, across the state, uh, specifically the center, southeastern part of the state that probably just didn't get as high yields as we'd hoped. Uh, we had trials specifically in the southeastern part of the state that we thought were going to be the best yields we ever seen, and we just didn't uh, get the amount of yields that we we're hoping. Also, areas in the northern part of the state, too, um, and we'll talk about kind of why we didn't maximize our yields um, in those areas. You know, the first reason is is uh, soil moisture or um, precipitation condition, conditions, specifically in August. So August and even in the September you look at the center part of the state, southeastern part of the state, this yellow area, 50% of normal. So it did get dry, especially central part of the state to the southeastern part of the state. It got kind of dry on us, um, and I think it really hurt some of those grain fill aspects of that corn crop in those specific areas. And also disease, too. Uh, you think about tar spot. Um, tar spot is, you know, been mostly prevalent towards the northern area of the state, but they are starting to find it in, you know, the river bottoms of the southern part of the state. Kentucky found it uh, for the first time this year. Um, so especially folks in the southern part of Indiana who maybe haven't looked at it or seen it in the past, um, it's something that you should be paying attention to moving forward. Um, it's a disease that, you know, you kind of got to be on top of. Uh, you got to scout your fields. Uh, we do see some responses with hybrids. 
um, and just really getting out and timing those fungicides. You know, typically we see big responses to fungicides when it's pretty severe. We don't want folks just spraying fungicides to spray fungicides because, you know, there's always that risk of resistance, but tar spot, you know, just keep an eye out for it. Difference with tar spot, then you think about something like Southern rust, Southern rust, typically you get a clean slate every year where we're just paying attention to whether or not it blows up from the South with storm systems or not. Tar spot, the difficulty with it is typically once you have it, you have it. Um, and also it's a fairly new disease. So we're trying to learn everything we can um, on that front, but we are starting to find it in Southern Indiana and Northern Kentucky. It was found in all but 10 counties um, across the state this year. So just be aware of it. Um, Darcy Talenko, who's our pathologist, um, is probably the top tar spot researcher really around. Um, so I always tell folks to, to watch her website, watch her articles, uh, fieldcrosspathology.purdue.edu. Um, she tracks this disease throughout the entire year. Um, she'll tell you what counties it in, it, what, what counties it is in, when it's in them, and when to be looking for it, to scout for it, and then trying to understand: Do I need to spray or do I not need to spray? But typically, that that fungicide timing usually is around that R1 to R2 time if you need it. Um, also, too, if you look at areas where we had, you know, where it did get dry on us, especially in the central southeastern part of the state, we did see some of this this year. This is from southeastern part of the state. We had premature ear drop. So when it got really dry on us, this ears basically were falling over, and that's before that corn plant reached black layer. Um, and that's not, not what we want to see from a kernel weight and a kernel fill uh, aspect for that corn crop. It comes back to that ear shank. So if it gets really dry on us in certain areas, if we don't have enough water in that plant, I think about that ear shank basically as a hose. If we don't have enough water in that plant, we don't have what they often refer to as turgidity in that plant, um, that ear shank can kink. So you think about how that ear is filling at this time period, those photosynthates assimilates where they're moving from that green leaf area to the ear, they're going through that ear shank. So if it kinks before we reach that black layer or before that corn plant matures, um, that's where we can lose some yield. So I think overall across the state, we lost some yield, especially from the kernel weight and grain fill aspect from tar spot, um, especially in the northern part of the state, but also where it did get dry in us. So central, southeastern part of the state um, where we did see some of these um, symptoms where we had premature ear drop um, later in the season where we lost some yields. But Overall, you can't complain with uh, a lot of the yields we saw across the state. Uh, hopefully, we can keep moving that, uh, that needle forward um, in the next coming years. So I do want to talk quickly uh, about kernel weight. Um, I think kernel weight um, from an as aspect of maximizing corn yields, especially in the future, is just, is just going to become more and more important. Uh, we think about how do we optimize and maximize corn yield throughout the season. Basically, a corn plant is developing these yield components throughout the entire season and trying to optimize all four of these yield components throughout the entire season really leads to how we can get some of these maximum yields um, across the state. So really, the four yield components are plants per acre. So typically, your seeding population, your plant, you know, your stand establishment, what is your final plant population, um, ears per plant, which is typically one ear per plant, and also kernels per ear. So you think about periods during pollination. Um, you think about rows around and, and kernels up, you know, in those early vegetative, those rapid growth phase periods, and also kernel weight. So kernel weight, I feel like kind of gets forgotten about sometimes because it's in that later portion of the season. Um, there tends to be areas where we think corn yield has been made, but there's still a lot of yield that can be made um, from the kernel weight aspect. So all four of these yield components really drive what that yield and weight per acre is. So I like to share this, this figure here, just kind of showing the importance of kernel weight and why there's still quite a bit of yield left to be made even late in the growing season for that corn crop. Um, so this table here is just looking at the R5 growth stage. R5 is dent. So if I'm walking you know, fields later in the season, I'm pulling ears, doing yield checks, my kernels are starting to dent, that's when I'm at that R5 growth stage. So beginning R5 growth stage here, that kernel is about 60% moisture, but really, I really kind of focus in on this, this column here. Um, so beginning R5 growth stage, we're only at about 45% kernel uh, weight. So beginning R5, 
got about 30 days till we reach black layer that that corn plant's done it's mature it's no longer making yield so even in that last 30 days we still have about 55 percent kernel weight left to go um, they've looked at studies where they looked at you know complete plant death you look at, you know, if we had 100% leaf loss, you had a, just a horrific hail damage come through at that time period, you can lose upwards of 20 to 40% yield, even at beginning R5. And what really drives that is losing some of that photosynthetic leaf area or just killing that plant off altogether just hurts that kernel weight aspect. Um, and we can still lose a significant amount of yield even at that beginning R5. Um, another aspect with R5 is that if you split it year and a half, you can start to find that milk line. So basically looking at where that milk line is can kind of give you a pretty good idea of what the kernel moisture is, how much kernel dry matter do I have, and also, you know, how much longer I have until I reach black layer. Um, you think about folks that, that irrigate, so try not to shut that irrigation off too soon. Um, so monitoring that milk line kind of gives you a pretty good idea of how much longer I have until that corn plant reaches maturity or black layer and it's it's done. Um, think about half milk line. You get to half milk line, that's when we're about 40% kernel moisture. That time period, we're only we're actually at about 90% um, kernel dry weight. So if I have significant stress come in, you know, nitrogen stress, disease, terrible drought, hail damage, at that time period, if I'm at about half milk line, I might only lose five to 10% yield instead of, you know, maybe 25 to 40% yield at beginning R5. And this is about, you know, you have about 10 days, 10 to 14 days until we reach black layer at that specific time. So this picture just kind of gives you an idea of what that half milk line uh, growth stage looks like. So you can see this kind of yellow hardened endosperm. If I were to split an ear in half um, at that R5 growth stage, that dent, you can see this milk line here, more of that liquid endosperm, that white portion here. So this year, it's about 90% kernel weight at this time period, about 40% uh, kernel moisture. Gives you a pretty good idea what that, what that half milk line stage looks like. So I share this figure here um, and just kind of reiterating the importance of kernel weight. All I want you to look at is the direction of the lines, which way are the lines going on the figure in the left hand side here and also the figure on the right hand side. Um, so folks at Pioneer took all their hybrids um, throughout, you know, from now all the way into the past. I think they went all the way back into, you know, early varieties back in the 1930s um, and looked at, okay, yields are higher now, obviously. Um, I would hope we have better hybrids than we did in the past, but, but why? You know, one of those big aspects is stress tolerance. We can have higher plant populations. We have better traits and so on. But what about physiological aspects? What other aspects have driven why we have some better yields now in our hybrids? Why do we have better hybrids now than we did in the past? Um, so they looked at specifically kernel number. So the amount of num number of kernels they had per each ear on these hybrids, they went back to about the 1930s all the way up. And you can see these lines is pretty consistent. This is across different populations. They looked at this. And about, you know, the early 1990s or so, we start to see these lines kind of kind of flatten out. Um, so really from about the early 1990s till now, uh, kernel number hasn't changed much um, at all in these, in these newer hybrids. But re what really has changed um, recently is kernel weight. So you look at this figure here on the right, this they looked at different across different nitrogen rates. So HN would be, you know, your optimum nitrogen rate. LN would be kind of a, a half nitrogen rate. Um, and what they found at, you know, optimum nitrogen rates, kernel weight is still increasing. You know, you look at how that compares to kernel number, it kind of flattened off here, kernel weight is still increasing. Um, so kernel weight has really driven some of those yield increases uh, that we see, especially in recent hybrids um, that we have today. So overall, um, kernel weight really has been a larger driver of hybrid grain yield increases than kernel number. Um, overall, hybrids now have greater green leaf retention during grain fill, which have a longer grain fill period uh, when it comes to hybrids now than we did in the past. Um, you think about, I worked, I looked at some of this um, when I was in the state of Kentucky, and I know Bob looked at this in the past too, that you look at temperatures, um, especially, you know, nighttime temperatures during, you know, July and August. Typically when we have state record yields or really high yields across the state, 
Those temperatures seem, seem to be a little bit on the lower side, especially during June and, or July and August. Um, you think about extending that grain fill period um, in corn. If we have lower temperatures, we have lower respiration rates, that corn plant just doesn't work as hard, doesn't burn as much energy at night when those temperatures are lower. It's not burning as much energy that grain fill period tends to extend. We have a longer grain fill period. We have longer green leaf retention during grain fill. It tends to increase that kernel weight, tends to result in higher yield. So paying attention to how do we keep um, extending that grain fill period and keeping that green leaf retention higher, um, keeping basically that corn plant stress-free um, even later in the season uh, to keep maximizing yield moving forward. Um, so overall, extended grain fill period, equals higher kernel weight and also greater yield potential, especially in the hybrids that we have now. So I'm gonna switch gears here. Uh, that was just kind of an overview of, of what we saw during the state, um, really good yields, state record yields, but we did have some areas that we just didn't have the yields um, that we'd hoped and kind of the reason behind that. You know, I think disease and also some kind of dry areas were kind of some of the drivers later in the season. Um, and that kernel weight aspect, you know, losing, losing some of that kernel weight, despite having, you know, excellent um, ears, excellent kernel set um, is why we probably didn't see maximum yields um, in certain areas of the state. Um, so I'm going to switch gears to some of the sulfur work. Um, so Bob Nielsen and Jim Camberato have been working on this uh, for about five to six years now, um, something that I helped with this year and that we're moving forward, uh, working with um, even more across the state this coming year. So why sulfur? Um, if you've ever been to a sulfur talk, you've probably seen this graph um, in the past. And number one, air is cleaner. Uh, I always tell folks that, you know, I have definitive proof that air is cleaner now than what it was in the past because you all as farmers have to pay for sulfur fertilizer now and you didn't have to in the past. Uh, it really comes back to, you know, those coal-fired plants. You look at areas in, you know, Kentucky, also in Gary, Indiana, those steel plants, we just don't have the free sulfur from the air that we did in the past. Um, also, fertilizers, you know, fertilizers are cleaner. They're a lot cleaner than they, what they were in the past. You think about phosphorus fertilizers, they use sulfuric acid um, to process those fertilizers, DAP and MAP. Uh, we just don't get a lot of that free sulfur from those fertilizers in the past that we did in the past. So in 2000, now uh, we typically got about 10 to 16 pounds of sulfur per acre per year. Now we only get about, we get a little bit but about five pounds of sulfur per acre per year or less, depending on where you're at in the state. So why sulfur? Why is sulfur important? You know, number one, protein synthesis. Uh, it's important for chlorophyll production. It's really necessary for photosynthesis. Um, it's really similar to nitrogen um, and the way it behaves in the plant and why it's important in the plant. Um, the difference with sulfur than nitrogen is that it's non-mobile in the plant tissue. What does this mean that it's non-mobile in the plant tissue? those deficiency symptoms show up in the youngest leaves. So if I look up across a cornfield, it's kind of yellow, just doesn't look very good. You know, walking out in those fields, seeing, you know, that yellowing or that striping in, in those youngest leaves, those upper leaves, maybe that may give me a pretty good indication. Maybe I do have some sulfur deficiency um, in my field. Um, sulfur is typically found in organic matter and also crop, crop residue. Uh, it typically needs to be in soluble sulfate form for that corn plant to take it up. That's what makes sulfur so difficult is because it's like nitrogen. It's just so hard to predict how much gets released from that organic matter and residue, crop residue, tends to be very environmentally dependent. Um, also, similar to nitrogen, sulfate can move. Um, it's negatively charged. It can move in the soil. A lot of sulfur is in the subsoil layers. That's why it's difficult to soil test for sulfur. Um, often those soil tests aren't very accurate because it's a snapshot in time. Um, it's difficult to understand how much is getting released from organic matter and because it can move like nitrogen. Think about if you only take an eight inch soil sample, typically when we sample for sulfur, we might go 24 inches deep because that sulfur can move in that soil profile and get a lot deeper. Uh, so something to be aware of when taking uh, soil samples for sulfur. So plant requirements, uh, corn removes about 0.05 to 0.1 pounds of sulfur per bushel. So if I have a 200 bushel corn crop, it removes about 10 to 20 pounds of sulfur each year. 
Soil organic S mineralization. So how much do we get from the soil? Uh, you get about organic sulfur in, our, in that soil profile. We typically have about 100 pounds of organic sulfur in the top six inches of the soil for every 1% of organic matter. So if I have 3% organic matter soil, I have about 300 pounds of organic S in that top six inches. Compare that to nitrogen, not as much as nitrogen. You know, nitrogen is about 2,000 pounds of organic nitrogen per each 1% organic matter. So if I had a 3% organic matter soil, I might have 6,000 pounds of organic nitrogen. But the issue is, is how much of that is going to become available during that season. So typical for, for sulfur, we see about two to six pounds of sulfur become available each season. And that can be pretty dependent on your soil organic matter levels uh, that you have in your fields. So this picture is just a, a pictures that I took uh, this spring. I'm just showing you what sulfur deficiency looks like. So it shows up in those youngest leaves, those upper leaves, and you can see that striping, you know, intervenal chlorosis going on, that striping in those corn plants. You know, this is pretty textbook sulfur deficiency. Um, issue with that is that there is other nutrient deficiencies that kind of mimic sulfur, um, but sulfur does tend to be the most common. But in certain areas, certain soil types, you might see, you know, magnesium, you know, manganese, other, other nutrient deficiencies. Um, so it is important to tissue test. Um, that's where sulfur, you can use tissue testing and soil testing, you know, taken from the good areas, taken from the bad areas and compare those. Um, it gives you a pretty good idea what that nutrient deficiency is uh, going on in your corn plants. So this picture here um, is, is pretty interesting one that we took this year. Um, this is from one of our research trials this past year um, up in northwest Indiana. But what's interesting is that corn plants in the foreground here aren't sulfur deficient. They're about a growth stage ahead. They're a lot more healthy. Corn plants in the back right here are sulfur deficient. Uh, we had a sulfur study back here, but they're sulfur deficient. They're about a growth stage behind. They just don't look as healthy um, as the corn plants up here. Um, and what really drove that was, was tillage. Um, and that just comes back to the importance of soil mineralization of sulfur. Um, so no-till was self, this back area, this farmer here tilled his headlands on his field um, and where he tilled spring tillage um, in this field, um, we didn't have any sulfur deficiency. Um, in the background where we did have no-till that was sulfur deficient, delayed plant development. Typically when those Soils are cooler, they're wetter. We just aren't seeing that mineralization of that sulfur from that organic matter. If we think about what tillage does, um, just introduces oxygen and warms with that soil quicker. We have greater sulfur release early on in the season. Um, so this is pretty interesting this year where we saw sulfur deficient plants in no-till and we didn't see sulfur deficient plants in conventional till. It doesn't always translate um, into yield responses. Uh, we've seen plenty of yield responses to sulfur fertilizer in conventionally tilled soils um, as well, which we'll talk about here in a second. So field scale research, uh, we had, you know, about 12 field scale corn sulfur trials in 2021 across the state, and they've been doing this since 2017. So for about a total of 40 uh, field scale sulfur trials. Um, and we will be continuing these trials across the state this year. So you can see this is just from 2021, um, these stars um, this year. So pretty vast area across the state of Indiana. Um, I just like sharing this picture because it, it gives folks a pretty good idea of how some of our research trials look. Um, we're pretty fortunate here at Purdue to be able to do some of these large scale field scale research trials, both at our research farms and also in cooperation with farmers. Um, it just gives us really good data. Um, with some of these treatments. So each one of these is a plot. You can see they run the entire length of the field. Typically we have about 12 row plots and we're just comparing sulfur applied, no sulfur applied, sulfur applied, no sulfur applied. Um, and we harvest the center of those, those 12 row plots. So overall uh, with our treatments, we looked at specifically sulfur applied at side dress. So about V5 to V6. And that's ammonium thiosulfate or ATS mixed with UAN at V5 to V7. Um, so a lot of sulfur research that's been done here at Purdue. Typically, we see a better response of corn to sulfur that's applied 
at that side dress timing more so than when it's plied um, earlier. Um, you can get away with some, you know, maybe five pounds or so in a starter, but typically we find that if you apply 15 pounds of sulfur per acre at side dress, we just have a more consistent uh, response for that sulfur fertilizer. Uh, sulfur rates range from about seven and a half to 30 pounds of sulfur per acre across years. We've kind of settled in on right around that 15 pounds of sulfur per acre applied at that side dress timing. Anything beyond that 15 pounds of sulfur per acre um, at side dress, we just don't see any greater yield responses beyond that rate across all the studies uh, that have been done throughout the years. So I'd just like to share this picture it just shows you some of that data that we're able to pull from these large scale field research trials. So this is um, data that we pulled this year from this study um, and how it overlays off the combine. So each we use you know commercial combines and yield monitors. Each one of these points is every two seconds that yield monitor will, will give us a yield rating. Um, and we're able to look at these sulfur responses across a lot of different zones, a lot of different areas, soil types across the entire field. And that's just really some of the benefits of this both on-farm research and large-scale research um, that we're able to do um, across the state. This figure here just shows what were the yield responses um, to sulfur um, across all of our locations this year. Uh, where we have a plus, that means when we applied sulfur, 15 pounds at side dress, we had a positive yield response to sulfur. So you look about northwest Indiana, we had about 17 bushel response to sulfur. Another field, we had negative two bushel response um, to sulfur based on soil type. Um, you look at even West Lafayette, so deep, dark, you know, really productive soils, three to four percent of granite matter soils. We had upwards of a 10 bushel response to sulfur this year. Um, Southwest Indiana, so Vincennes area, about a 20 bushel response. Southeast Indiana, about a four bushel response. Eastern Indiana, about a six bushel response. And then we did have a few, few sites uh, where we just didn't see any response um, to sulfur fertilizer. Uh, what's unique about both in Northwest Indiana here and then in Southwest Indiana here is soil type. Uh, both these locations, uh, you know, sandier soils, sandy loam type soils, you know, we just had lower organic matter, less mineralization from that organic matter really drove some of those significant responses to sulfur applied. But, you know, you can see where we do see responses to sulfur, especially even in the West Lafayette area, where those soils were cool, a lot more cool, they were a lot more wet early on in the season. We had sulfur deficiency really across our entire research farm um, this year and just saw really strong responses uh, to sulfur early on in the season. Um, and pretty similar even in the southeast Indiana and then eastern Indiana. Um, so we do see some responses, but it's, it's difficult because <laughs> we do see some inconsistent um, responses as well. So we're trying to do everything we can to kind of tease out where we see responses um, and where we don't. So across the board, so 2017, they had a total of four trials and 25% of them saw a positive response to S. You look at 2018, about 60% had a positive response to sulfur. 2019, about 33%. 2020, 25%. And then this year we had about half of our trials had a positive response to sulfur fertilizer. So across the board, 40 locations, you see about 15 of them had a positive response to sulfur. So that's about 40% of our location so far. Um, do you see a positive yield response to that ammonium tile sulfate applied at side dress? Um, average yield increases. So where we do see a response, it typically is, is on average about 11 bushels, uh, which is pretty good. Um, and those responses can range from anywhere from four all the way up to 23 bushels per acre, uh, depending on the location of the year. So another thing we looked at was tissue samples. Uh, when it comes to sulfur, something we've seen um, that correlates pretty good to yield responses is tissue samples. Um, this is especially at R1 tissue samples. So if we pull the ear leaf at R1, um, thing with corn, typically R1 ear leaf tissue samples tend to be the most accurate uh, when it comes to a nutrient standpoint in that corn crop. Um, so this graph is just looking at relative yield. So if you look at this horizontal line, anything below that horizontal line means we had a positive yield response to sulfur. This vertical line here means our ear leaf sulfur concentration, which was about 0.18. So it's 1.8, but it equates to about 0.18%. So if I submit a tissue sample to a lab, I get it back. It's at 0.18 or 0.17% 
or below, it gives me a pretty good indication that I was going to have a positive yield response to sulfur fertilizer applied. If I'm above that 0.18% or so, oops, I'm not seeing any responses um, to sulfur fertilizer. Difficulty with that is that there are one tissue samples. Um, you know, you might pull some of your tissue samples, there just isn't much you can do in that specific year because it's that R1. Um, it tends to be a little late. Um, but if you did suspect that you had some sulfur deficiencies in some of your fields, um, going out at R1, pulling some of those tissue samples gives you a pretty good, good idea. You know, maybe I should have applied sulfur this year. Maybe I would have got a yield response to that sulfur. Um, so starting this year, we're actually going to shift more towards those earlier um, tissue samples, see if we can get a pretty good correlation um, and kind of get a good percentage um, when it comes to earlier tissue samples in corn. Maybe we can help predict some of these sulfur responses uh, moving forward, give you an idea if I tissue sample earlier, it's at this specific percentage, maybe I need to put sulfur in my side dress application um, to get a yield response to sulfur. So I'd just like to share this picture. Um, this is a drone image that we took this year uh, from Northwest Indiana on those, you know, fine sandy loams, those low organic matter soils, you know, very similar to what we saw in Southwest Indiana um, this year. But this is even, even in late July, you can see where we had sulfur applied and where we didn't, you know, those darker green areas where we had sulfur applied and then those lighter green areas where we didn't have sulfur applied. Um, and this equated to about a 17 bushel um, response. So still seeing sulfur deficiencies even in late July and August in that corn crop. So overall, um, corn response to sulfur is fairly inconsistent. Um, it's difficult um, for us. Um, it's just something that we're trying to get where we can try and predict some of those, these responses. But overall, we've seen positive responses observed across a wide range of soil textures and organic matter levels. We've seen corn respond in, you know, sandier soils, but we've also seen it respond in, you know, highly productive, high organic matter soils, even high clay content soils, um, even in southeast of Indianapolis. We've seen uh, positive responses there. But pay attention to those sandy, low organic matter soils. I think those low organic matter soils, we're just not seeing that mineralization early on in the season. That's typically where we see a fairly consistent response to sulfur fertilizer uh, applications. Also pay attention to early season weather conditions. So where it is cool and wet, you think about even in no-till acres as well. Is it cool, wet, you know, are we just having poor mineralization? Walk some of your fields, scout some of your fields early on the season. Am I seeing some sulfur deficiencies in those crops? A lot of times where we see sulfur deficiencies showing up, we have a pretty good indication that we'll probably see a positive response to sulfur fertilizer in those fields. Overall, soil testing really is not a good um, indicator for sulfur deficiency. Uh, I talked about this earlier because sulfate can move and also it's just difficult to understand how much sulfur is being released from that organic matter. It's very, very similar to nitrogen. But, you know, soil testing for sulfur can be used um, with tissue samples. I just tell folks, take it from the good looking areas, from the bad looking areas um, and compare. Gives you a pretty good idea what those nutrients are deficient in those specific areas. Map and DAP fertilizers. So phosphorus fertilizers, you do still get a little bit of sulfur um, from those map and DAP fertilizers and they may confound some of those sulfur deficiencies. Um, when we do some of these trials, we typically want to understand was MAP or DAP applied in that fall or spring. When those are applied, oftentimes we just don't see is a significant response to sulfur fertilizer because you do get a little bit of free sulfur still from those MAP and DAP fertilizers. If you applied 75 pounds units of P2O5 specifically, you typically get about two to five pounds um, sulfur per acre. Scout and tissue test. Um, I think this, this is important really for anything, you know, always scouting your fields, walking your fields, um, trying to understand what are my issues going on in those fields and how do I fix um, some of those issues moving forward. So scout those fields early on, take a look. Am I seeing sulfur deficiency symptoms? Am I seeing nutrient deficiency symptoms? Take some tissue tests, take them in you know, conjunction with some soil tests. Um, gives you a pretty good idea. Do I have sulfur deficiency or do I not? 
And also the responses of sulfur applied in starter are fairly minimal. Uh, we just see a better response to sulfur applied at that side dress timing. Um, but folks may put, you know, five pounds or so of sulfur in their starter. Issues with sulfur, you know, be careful with the rates you have. If you apply too, too high rates, it can get a little too hot for that seed. But if you have a little bit of sulfur early on in that um, starter, we do recommend, you know, still coming back with some ATS at side dress. That's just one where we see more consistent uh, responses to those sulfur applications. And lastly, uh, max yield response with corn response to sulfur it could be from anywhere from, you know, seven and a half all the way up to 15 pounds per acre of sulfur applied at side dress. Really anything beyond 15 pounds of sulfur applied at side dress. We just don't see any greater yield responses uh, beyond that rate. So what's next? Uh, finishing up here, you know, again, me, I haven't quite been here a year yet, um, but I'm going to have a lot of research really across the entire state um, this year, um, including continuing some of the sulfur work, you know, further research to understand why we have inconsistent responses to sulfur. Um, that's really driven by having more data, more years, more on-farm on locations, you know, more fields it just gives us better data, allows us to get better recommendations, especially for these nutrients moving forward. What about sulfur applied to soybean prior to corn? So typically we'll see uh, sulfur applied in both crops, um, but we did see, you know, some response where we did have a little bit of residual, some of that sulfur actually hanging around. So how much is hanging around? Can we maybe get away with sulfur applying? And one crop instead of both. Um, that's something that we started last year and we'll be looking at uh, more further this year. Different sulfur fertilizer sources. Uh, so we typically focused in on ammonium thiosulfate. You think about different dry fertilizer sources, think about elemental sulfur too. So co-granulated elemental sulfur, uh, mosaic fertilizer products has these. Um, difficulty with elemental sulfur, it's often kind of marketed as a slow release sulfur product. Um, but a lot of times we need, we see where we need to have soil temperatures of even 80, 90 degrees um, to get that elemental sulfur to convert to sulfate. So even if it is kind of a slow release, it often is too late um, in certain instances in certain conditions, but it's something that we hope to look at uh, moving forward. And also early season tissue test prediction. We have a pretty good tissue test prediction when it comes to R1 tissue tests. Um, but what about, you know, taking tissue tests early on in the season, try and predict whether or not we need side dress uh, sulfur or not. And lastly, um, I share this, this um, slide at every single meeting that I've been doing, um, especially with me being new. Um, we're always looking for more folks uh, for on-farm research, even especially in the southern part of, of Indiana. Uh, I've had a lot of folks in southern Indiana tell us, well, you, you forget us, forget about us uh, in this part of the state. Um, but we're always looking for folks um, really statewide to cooperate with us um, on on-farm research. Uh, we're trying to get a on-farm research program, really, you know, Bob and Jim have done this for many, many years. We're hoping to expand upon that moving forward. Uh, so the more folks that want to work on uh, work with us on a lot of different topics moving forward um, is just really helps us out a lot. Um, the more data, more locations just means better recommendations. Um, and also you get to work directly with Purdue University researchers. I hope that's a good thing um, from my standpoint, um, but it just helps us learn and hopefully you can learn um, from it as well. And, and lastly, it just comes back to identifying management factors that either work or don't work on specifically your fields and your farm. Uh, we know every single product or management practice doesn't work on every single field and every single area and every single year across the state. But the more fields, the more environments that we have, the better we can tease out where these responses occur and where they don't occur. Um, so we're always looking for folks that want to participate. So I always tell folks, reach out to your extension educators in the county um, or reach out to me directly as well um, to get involved um, if you want in the future. So lastly, finish up here. I think I'm about on time, okay. Um, but just sharing my information, uh, especially with me being new, it's important for me to get my information out there. Uh, my email, phone number too. I know virtual presentations are difficult, 
Um, if you have further questions, want to talk to me about anything uh, with this, with these projects that we're doing, and then you can talk about some of the projects I'm going to have going across the state this year, you know, reach out anytime. Um, and also my website, you know, I try to update that, you know, week, or every week in the summer, but, you know, every few weeks um, during the winter, I'm always trying to add more articles, information, um, and so on moving forward. Um, so that's, that's all I have. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions if I've got any time um, and reach out to me anytime um, as well. Okay, so pesticide mini balls. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between a bulk and a mini bulk. And we're going to talk about when secondary containment is necessary and what's involved in filling your mini bulks if you do have them, you know, and some pressure testing, what you're going to do if you own them there on the farm and just kind of an, an overall summary. So first of all, why might you choose to use a mini bulk? One is, you know, you're reducing your handling costs compared to going to Rural King or Tractor Supply or some other source and, and purchasing your you know, your pesticides through in these two gallon or five gallon containers, or even, even a 55 you know, gallon drum. You're just gonna have lower handling costs. You have fewer containers that you're using. And in general, it's just kind of a cost reduction. And then bulk storage. So you can buy bulk products without having to invest in significant bulk storage containers. And so it's a cost saving there. And then another thing is you can return them for credit. So if you are, if you are purchasing, purchasing pesticides from the co-op, you know, for example, you, know, you might have put a deposit on the mini bulk, but then when you return it, you get your credit back for that mini bulk. So here's, it's another way that you can save money on it. And the other thing is they can give you credit for the product that remains in the mini bulk. And so you don't have wasted product. They're refillable. So this is something that can be refilled many times and that saves with plastic waste, again, from your smaller jugs that are not refillable. And so it saves space in landfills, it reduces the amount of plastic used overall. And then your bulk pricing. And so again, if you're purchasing pesticides in mini bulks, you can get a discount on the price of your pesticides compared you know, to buying in smaller quantities because they do qualify as a bulk container. Fewer injuries. And so when you are looking at a mini bulk compared to, you know, especially compared to some of your smaller quantities of pesticides, it's fewer trips up and down the spray rig to refill your tank. And so when you're reducing you know, the times up and down, that's just a reduction in injuries overall or the chance of injury. And again, we mentioned the reducing the use of plastic. So it virtually eliminates the need for plastic jugs and the triple rinsing that's involved in disposing of those jugs. And so it just kind of makes it easier to work with your pesticides. And so let's compare bulks versus mini bulks. So in general, when we're talking about liquid bulk, we're talking about any undivided quantity more than 55 gallons. And the key is undivided. A mini bulk is a container and you know, typically it's a plastic container that has a metal frame around it. And it can hold anywhere from 56 to 400 gallons. And so I know we have all seen these containers and a lot of people do use them. So a bulk container is anything over 55 gallons. Stationary storage, so your, you know, so your large bulk containers, that's anything over 400 gallons. A mini bulk, gal a mini bulk is, is categorized as something from 56 to 400 gallons. And so if you're going above 400 gallons, that's where you'd have a stationary storage unit. You know, between 56 and 400, that's classified as mini bulk. Okay, so question for everyone, and you can type the answer in the chat box if you are joining us online.
a storage room has 10 2.5 gallon plastic containers and a 35 gallon container. Would any be considered bulk? And I'm seeing people shaking their heads no. And the reason is because to be bulk, it has to be undivided. And so we are looking at divided containers. And so no single container here holds more than 55 gallons. So it is not considered bulk. Are these liquid bulk pesticides? So the first, the 55 gallon drums are not because again, they are divided quantities. The 265 gallon mini bulk, that is a bulk container. The sprayer tank, even though it holds more than 55 gallons is not a liquid bulk pesticide because it's not storage. It's being used to immediately apply to the fields. So the only one that qualifies as a liquid bulk is the mini bulk container. So sprayer tanks don't count as bulk tanks. 55 gallon drums, even though there are two of them, don't count. It's the undivided quantity of a storage container, a storage unit that is over 55 gallons. Okay, let's talk a little bit about secondary containment. So applicators may order mini bulks in the fall. Do mini bulks fall under secondary containment regulations? So if they're going to in 30 days, they have to have secondary containment. And that's something, and some people will try to find loopholes but if you're going to store them over 30 days, it doesn't matter what you're storing them on. They need to have some kind of secondary containment. And that's where this slide comes in. Does putting mini bulks on a trailer exempt them from the 30 days? No. Putting them on a truck or a trailer does not exempt them from the 30 days because you're still storing them, even if it's on a mobile platform. So mini bulk that's stored on a truck, a trailer, or on the ground for over 30 days must have secondary containment. So farmers may have large, which would be 3,000 to 5,000 gallon on farm storage tanks. Are there different secondary containment regulations between farmers and ag retailers? No, there's no difference in the regulations for secondary containment, whether you're a farmer or a retailer. All, you know, all stationary tanks have to follow Indiana's secondary containment regulations. So again, these, are, these regulations are in place for a purpose. And so it doesn't matter whether you're selling pesticides or whether you're keeping them for on-farm use. If you are storing these bulk liquid pesticides, you do have to have that secondary containment. So here is, here's an example of secondary containment. So you have your primary containment in the tanks, and then you have the dikes around the tanks that provide the secondary containment. So if the tanks were to leak, then you have something that's gonna contain those pesticides until it can be cleaned up. Do I have to store empty mini bulks in containment? No. Once they're empty, you can store them anywhere. And again, what we're concerned about is product leaking. So if there's no product to leak, there's no need for secondary containment. A 110 gallon mini bulk still has 25 gallons of product. Does it need secondary containment? Yes. The container's capacity determines whether it's bulk. And that's what triggers the secondary containment. It's not the amount of product in the container, it's the amount of product that a container is capable of holding. Can I use the operational pad associated with stationary tanks to store mini bulks? Yes, you are, a, you are allowed to do that per Indiana regulations. So you may use that operational pad. It needs to be 10 by 20 feet minimum and it needs to be sloped to hold 750 gallons. But this is not a good long-term solution. If you're gonna be storing a lot of pesticides in mini bulks, 
you probably want to have a, a separate containment area for them. But in general, yes, you can do this. It's just not your long-term solution. So refilling mini bulks. So the end users, which would be the farmers, are going to transfer pesticides from one container to another for their own use. So in this case, you're not subject to repackaging regulations. So if you have, if you have a large storage unit, you know, a large unit, and you want to fill a mini bulk from it, you are not subject to repackaging regulations from EPA if you're doing it for your own use. A retailer, so if, if the co-op were to refill your, your mini bulk, they transfer product from one container to another for resale, they are producers when we're looking at these regulations. So as a farmer, you're the end user. Superior Ag, for example, would be the, the producer or the retailer. And so they are subject to the EPA refill requirements. And so this is what they require. So they're going to require that they, that they register as a pesticide producing establishment. So if they're going to be retailing these pesticides and transferring them from a stationary or from a, a stationary tank to your mini bulk, then they have to register as a pesticide producing establishment. They also must have a repackaging agreement with the pesticide manufacturers to repackage these bulk pesticides. If they're going to refill and repackage these materials, they have to mark each mini bulk with a unique ID or serial number when they repackage it. There's an exemption for direct shipment. So if the retailer is purchasing the mini bulks already filled from the manufacturers, they don't have to have the unique serial numbers. So again, if they're coming directly from the manufacturers and shipped to, to you as, a, as the end user, if they're, for instance, if you're ordering something through Superior Ag and it's, it's shipped directly or some other company and they, they order it on your behalf, but it's shipped directly from the manufacturer, then they don't have to put a unique serial number on that mini bulk. And so if they're going to refill these mini bulks, they have to have one-way valves that only allow the product to flow out of the tank. And so this is an example of some one-way valves. But all the valves that are used on these tanks have to be one-way valves. They also must place tamper evidence seals on or around the tank opening before they ship mini bulks. And this is for your protection. So you can be sure that the products that you're purchasing haven't been adulterated. And so this is an example of what a tamper evidence seal looks like. And the tamper ev evidence seal is for their protection as well, because if you are, if this is a tank that you are going to be returning to be refilled again, as long as that tamper evidence seal is there, they know that, the, that you haven't tampered with that product and they can give you a credit for the product that's left in the tank. If that seal's broken, they're not gonna give you the credit. So what should a retailer do if a mini bulk has a broken seal? They have to assume that it's been contaminated. And so at that point, they would have to require cleaning for the repackaging agreement from the manufacturer. So if, if a mini bulk were to come back to them and the seal is broken, I mean, even if it was broken accidentally, they're gonna to have to dispose of all that product. They're gonna to have to clean it and before they can put anything else in there. They also have to attach a new label to the mini bulk each time it's filled. And that will include the EPA establishment number and the net contents on the new label. So again, this is what the retailers have to do for you. And so the net contents that they put in, so that's what they've added to the mini bulk. Net contents does not include what may already be in there. So let's say that you had purchased glyphosate you know, from the co-op and you brought your tank back and it still had some glyphosate left in it. 
you know, maybe 25 gallons. There's still, if it's a 300 gallon tank, they're not going to put 300 gallons in there. They're going to, the net contents will be whatever they put in there. It's not going to include that 25 gallons that was left when you returned it. And so actually here's an example. A farmer returns a 250 gallon mini bulk with 25 gallons left. The retailer adds 225 gallons. What product amount would be written on the mini bulk label? It would be the 225 gallons would be the net content. Even if there may actually be 250 gallons in the container, the amount that they add is what goes on the label. They also have to keep records. So each time they fill the containers for you, they have to record the unique IDs, the dates, and the EPA registration numbers for the products. And they're required to keep these records for three years. So you have to keep your restricted use pesticide records for two years. They have to keep these records for three years. But again, if, if you're purchasing restricted use pesticides within these containers, there are more detailed records that they have to keep as well from the, you know, from the producer or the, the retailer standpoint. They also have to inspect the mini bulks for leaks and broken seals every time they refill them. And so every 2.5 years, they may need to you know, do a pressure test on these tanks. And so some things that they're gonna look at when they inspect them is they're gonna look and see if the valves are functioning properly. They're also going to check for spills, leaks, or cracks in the tank. They're gonna make sure that the label is affixed properly and the tamper evidence seals are intact. So this is their checklist that they have to look at every time they refill a tank. So what cleaning procedure do they have to follow when they switch from one product to another? It's the cleaning procedure for whatever was in the tank last. And so that's going to be found on the label for the product. So the product label will give the cleaning procedure for that product. So when they need to pressure test a tank, okay, well, do they need to pressure test many bulk containers? Yes or no? So they're going to have to check the UN code. So they'll need to look and see if it's an X, Y, or Z, and they're going to need to look at the date. And so this is, this is how they determine whether or not it needs to be pressure tested. So we see this one has a Y on it. And we see a date of 6.08 and we see the, the last inspection 6.08. And so they'll use that to determine. So in order to pressure test, they're going to close all of the openings on the tank. And then they're going to pressurize to three PSI and wait five minutes. So what they're looking for is signs of leaking or excessive bulging. And if they don't see any of those, the container will pass the test. And so after they pressure test, they need to permanently mark the container with the date. And it's going to be near the UN logo. They're also going to keep records of the name of the person who did the pressure testing, the testing site, when it was tested, the container ID number, whether it passed or failed, and, the, and a description of how they did the test. So what if a tank fails a test? At that point, they're going to permanently and prominently mark out of service or failed pressure test. They're going to note the date of the service in their records. And then that container will have to be either destroyed or recycled. And so it can't be used to, you know, to refill pesticides in. So what if you own the mini bulk? Again, as we said earlier, you can transfer material for your own use from another container. It could be a retailer mini bulk into your own mini bulk without EPA oversight. And so it could be from your own stationary tank or it could be from a mini bulk that you purchase pesticides in from a retailer. But when you're going to do that, you want to make sure that you take steps to prevent spills. So make sure that you are inspecting the tanks thoroughly. So even though you are not required to the same way retailers are, you should just do it because it's the right thing to do. Because, I mean, spilled pesticides is lost money. So... 
And again, you want to you know, prevent contamination. So make sure that you're not mixing products. Make sure that the product that is on the label is a product that's in there. Make sure that foreign you know, objects aren't getting into your container. In general, I mean, you don't want to you want you don't want to think it's glyphosate in the container and it'd be you know something you know two four D for instance. So you want to make sure that you know what's in that container. So again, just like a retailer would, even though you are not required to, you want to inspect the tanks thoroughly, the valves and the seals, and you want to, and you are, but you are required to make sure that they're properly stored. So again, secondary containment, if you're going to be storing for 30 days or more, and in general, you know, make sure that they're stored in a safe place where if they do leak, there's not going to be a big, you know, big problem. So a pad or secondary storage, even if they're going to be stored for a short amount of time. You want to make sure that you dedicate each of your mini bulks to a single product. So again, we don't want to mix our herbicides because of the potential for causing problems. We want to properly clean between uses. And again, the cleaning instructions will be on the label and keep the labels updated and maintain thorough records. And so if a label is starting to wear off, you might want to replace that label yes, because you want people to know exactly what is in this container. And again, keep your retailer happy. If you're going to be taking your tank to a retailer to be refilled, you know, make sure the tanks are safe. Inspect your tanks for tamper-resistant seals and one-way valves and clean the tanks before you take them to the retailer. So it's illegal for your retailer to fill mini bulks that don't meet repackaging standards. So that means any tank that doesn't have a one-way valve, it doesn't have a tamper evidence seal, and it, or if it's not an approved container, they can't refill it. And so they're not going to do it because it's illegal and their license is on the line. So in general, there are a lot of benefits to using you know, mini bulks, as, particularly when compared to you know, your smaller packages of pesticides. Again, you're reducing your handling costs. It allows you for bulk storage, particularly if you don't have the, you know, the freestanding tanks. You can return them for credit, which is another way you can save money. They're refillable. You can get bulk pricing on your products that you're purchasing. There are fewer injuries due to fewer times up and down the, the rig, and it reduces plastic waste. So in general, you know, they're very beneficial to have for both on both the farmer side and the retailer side. And so for more information, you can look at Purdue Publication 136, and it's available for free online. And if you need a, if you need the link to that, you know, feel free to contact me or Nick or you know, any other extension educator, and we can send you the direct link you know, to be able to to download that publication. And you know, it's a PDF. You can most PDFs you can use a reader on your phone or tablet to be able to read it there. And if you have any questions. Your point of contact is Joe Beckovitz at the Office of the Indiana State Chemist, and here's his contact information. So I'll leave that up for just a second if you want to write it down. And so this presentation was compiled by Ann Klein, Beth Van Sickle, and Fred Whitford and Joe Beckovitz. And so we really appreciate the work that they've put into to this, developing this presentation. opportunity to come and talk with you guys and uh, appreciate you guys being willing to work with me as uh, uh seemed like I, I put three kids down and every one of them wanted to talk and so uh, hopefully they're down I, I think i went upstairs about five times in the 20 minutes i've been waiting so i appreciate the opportunity to talk with you guys i'm going to share a few updates that uh, we've been doing over the last few years on soybean management um, in particular probably more on the fertility side that's kind of my bent anyway um, but if you have any other questions beyond what I, I put in here, please uh, put in the chat box or email or text or whatnot. Um, Dan, I believe you heard from earlier, uh, we've been around the Purdue crop chat over the last couple of years. 
Dan joined on board in, in May, and so it's just been a lot of fun to work with him. And so uh, we'll put that out uh, from time to time. It's actually a podcast that you can subscribe to, as well as look through some other venues through like Who's Rag. So some good resources there. Through the off season, we're normally about once a month, and during the growing season, probably every two weeks. So but that. Uh, I always like to kind of hit some highlights, you know, the take home straight away and optimizing soybean profits. And when we think about fertility prices, think about the availability of herbicide or not. Um, also, you know, what, you know, this beautiful weather we've been having, uh, what are some of the things that we can do to optimize it? And then especially in light of, um, you know, some of the supply issues as well as logistics. So our, our variety selection, that's still just one of the, the top producing um, for profit and production. So if we look at just a, a six to 12 bushel swing, I'm picking the, the best for our, our fields, our areas. Um, and then there, there occasionally is some interactions with timely management from planting and fertility. Uh, that, that alone does this well. Row spacing, again, most of this are in, in whatever configuration, but it, it's still good to know. Uh, usually if we're in a narrow row, so I'd say 15 inches or less, and we can get an optimal stand, um, we'll have a yield advantage of anywhere from five to 10% over like a 30 inch row. Um, and then when we bring in intense management, so we're scouting a lot, doing high yield management, um, the, the synergies of the narrow rows are even greater than those that are seen in 30 inch rows. So you get kind of the continue the multiplying effect of that narrow row. Obviously that helps us in canopy closure, sunlight interception, um, but then also in a day and age when we've got herbicide resistant weeds, as well as some other management trips we have across the field. Speaking of which, you know, stands, you know, that 100, 120,000 plants is still optimal. And, and actually, I've been pouring over this winter our, uh, we have 58 site years of seed rate uh, studies and varieties and locations and tillage and uh, planters and, and drills. And so, um, I, I'll update this a little bit, but I'll just go ahead and say that this 100, 120,000 plants, that's got a lot of cushion built into it. And so, you know, some of this changes based on equipment, some of the changes based on tillage or, or no-till in that combination. So some of these are basic, but I mean, it's actually now we've got data to, to back it up. Um, timely planting, uh, that's obviously one that I've been pushing for years. And conservatively, you know, if we go from uh, mid-May to late May, we've have a four to eight bushel yield difference. And usually we can even see more than that, you know, 10 to 12, 13 bushel response. And it's about getting no development, it's getting canopy, so then we can create the pods. Um, we plant timely. This also allows us to have a nice compact plant. Uh, I don't want to have a plant that's up to my chest. Uh, that allows us to have very stacked nodes and reproductive branches. Um, the benefit on this seed size is kind of a mixed bag. It really comes back to our August and September, how much benefit we get out of those timely plantings. Um, and then the other part of this is that you know, if we try to do any in-season management to recruit the losses of delay planting, we, we just can't make it up. So doing a good job and being timely in our planting has a, a huge benefit to soybeans and just setting the foundation. And those foundations go along with, you know, good root establishment, good stand establishment, so we can access water, we can access nutrients. In particular, um, you know, some of these uh, issues that we've been seeing over the number of years with sulfur supply, which has a, a cascading effect on modulation. So those are some of the quick take-homes to optimize uh, profits and, and production. You know, it, it's no surprise to anyone that we've got some huge differences in our, our cost of production now. So if we do a comparison between December 2020 and December 2021, our fertilizer proportion that goes into soybean production is now from 20 to 31%. And, you know, obviously this number is probably still increasing yet. If, if you're waiting to do a, an application this spring or you've been pretty busy this week, which actually I was today, I was been out uh, treatments uh, up in the northern part of the state because it's been 70, 75 degrees. And so able to get some early season treatment comparisons going on. Uh, seed costs um, are still going to be a top one as well as their overall pesticides and, and really herbicides in that. So within soil fertility, you know, if we've been in any kind of a build up and maintain approach, I think there is a good opportunity if we didn't get any uh, fertility on last fall or you're holding off on the prices, I think there's an opportunity. 
for us to forego some of the phosphorus or some of the potassium if we were already above sufficient levels. In other words, we don't have to force the, the, the envelope on this or force the, the issue. And so if the prices are too high, we can hold off if you're sufficient. Again, there's it's about the probability of, of return in that. Um, you know, obviously, if we're limited in phosphorus or potassium, you know, let's go ahead and apply. I'll, I'm going to share some data that I've had over the last few years and, and even some precursor data that um, I, I've been doing high yield management, you know, since I came here. And in particular, a lot of us have thought about potassium being a major, major driver for soybean yields. And, and it is, I mean, amongst other things. But a lot of times during seed fill, we'll get this yellow flash or tip back. Um, that's a potassium deficiency. And so a lot of us are thinking, let's just push the pota uh, potassium to it, potash in particular, this muriate of potash. And usually I put those out at planting. Well, there has been some issues uh, jumping up with that. And so uh, some chloride, uh, I think toxicity is what's really occurring when it's close to seeding or seed development um, or seedling development. Uh, so I'll hit on that. Sulfur, if it's needed, you know, 15 to 20 pounds of sulfur is, is more than enough. enough. Um, and again, documenting whether you've got a deficiency. So here is a case where we've got, you know, 20 pounds of sulfur is applied with a ammonium sulfate uh, planting versus nothing. You've got nice color differences. This really goes down to a nodulation effect. Um, and again, right now, my recommendation, if you're needing sulfur or you want to see if you have responsive sites, um, is to apply it as close to planting as possible. We got an email today, and I was actually applying uh, sulfur products today to look at this timing, right? Because we've got a lot of fields, a lot of um, floaters running today, spreading fertilizers. I was driving around, um, and it'd be nice to go and either mix it with potash or mix it with our MAF or DAP. Um, but my my reservation is that the sulfur and the soluble fertilizer forms that we have is just going to leach and get out of it get out of that soil profile and not be available. So what I'm looking at today and in comparison to pre-emergence is the idea of, okay, I'm looking at AMS. I'm actually looking at the pelletized gypsum, which is a little slower release of sulfur and then a, a new product that uh, to see if it's got a slow enough release so we don't leach, but also have it available for the growing season. So I personally actually spread today um, but the recommendations are to wait until I get the results and see if we can really do that. And then we also have some field conditions that can affect sulfur availability. You know, that, that being um, early plantings that have cool wet soils or high residue um, or cover crops that can kind of limit the amount of uh, turnover or mineralization rates is, is really what I'm driving at with that. So this last year, we, we certainly had a, a number of issues uh, pop up. Uh, from time to time, here's a case where we had Phytophthora just blew us out of the water. And you know, we got Dan, was, I've been giving him a hard time through the winter about this shot and saying, what, what in the world's going on here? But there, there's some kind of curiosities that are occurring. And I'm not saying that this solves Phytophthora, but certainly we had some issues. And it's interesting to see this, this treatment difference. In that same field, uh, you could see off to the left, uh, soybean stand looks Pretty good. Uh, development's really good versus those off to the right. So let's see if I can get a laser going by chance. Um, laser. Uh, let's see. Blue. I'll try blue today. Nope. Not doing anything for me. Well, that's fine. We can keep on going. So untreated off to the right. And then to the left is going to be 20 pounds of sulfur. Again, this is at planting or shortly thereafter. I'm not saying that it solves the phytophthora issue, but I think there's an interesting concept that comes along with this is that, you know, these soils, the no-till situation, which you can see, we have a, a fair amount of rain, so saturated conditions. And so I think some of the benefits, when we do see the benefit out of the sulfur treatment is helping those plants that are struggling to grow, uh, so limited development. Um, if you got saturated soils, uh, or the cool, any of those, we are limited mineralization, so the supply of nitrogen as well as sulfur, whereas in this case, we've got uh, sulfur being supplied, and then now you have a nodulation occurring, and then that's that's helping in that case. I'm going to switch this laser color so you can actually see it. Maybe. There we go. So, in that point, versus the ones on the right where 
Uh, they just sat there. They didn't have any encouragement in terms of the way they, they grew. They didn't have any uh, kind of starter effect, if you will. And so I think that was an interesting observation. The other part with this is that, um, you know, sulfur and some of the fungal work, uh, some of the other crops has actually had some some benefits and so some maybe antioxidant type effects. So kind of wonder if we catch a few of those benefits from time to time. All right, so let's get into these, these blending of the fertilizers and, and seeing if we can kind of get something to go on at the same time, because I know the sulfur application, if it's needed, I'm saying after planting or right, right close to it, and that's just another trip across the field. And I really don't want to be doing that unless we're getting a major benefit. So uh, can we either wait or mix it with some of the other sources? So I started a study a few years ago looking at, okay, untreated control. A nitrogen source here is urea. And then 17 half pounds of nitrogen phosphorus is going to be triple super phosphate at uh, 40 pounds of P2O5, and then 60 units of K2O uh, through uh, potash, muriate of potash, and then the combination of all three. And we've got that teamed up with now uh, ammonium sulfate at 20 pounds of sulfur, and then that gets you 17 half pounds of nitrogen. So you can kind of see where I get these rates from. And then now we add in the triple superphosphate or add in the, um, uh, the potassium or the combination, okay? So in doing that in 2019, our first go at this, and, and I'd, I'd seen some of this effects before. Like I said, I had some high yield management studies uh, in the past. And in those, I, I would see a, a three to five bushel yield hit from the potassium application. And I'm sure the world, we saw it again here in 2019. Uh, again, these are high, crazy high yields by any means. 2019 being a pretty, pretty late planted year as well as uh, the amount of rainfall. But we went from 50 bushel beans down to 45 bushel beans, so a five bushel yield hit with potassium. Um, now, if we would add in the nitrogen and phosphorus, so urea and triple superphosphate, they went back up to 50 bushel beans. So no different than untreated control. And if we added in the source that has ammonium sulfate, so now it's sulfur as well as nitrogen, um, we kind of erase that. And we, we even might uh, benefit. And then in this case, in this particular year, we had a, a greater benefit with triple superphosphate and ammonium sulfate when the soil conditions were already fit. We didn't have any issues in terms of uh, fertility supply of potassium or uh, fertility supply of, of phosphorus, but we were just looking at Okay, mixing those, do we have any benefit? Do we have any issues? And obviously we have an issue that did pop up in 2019. In 2020, same exact study, just a different year, uh, we did not have uh, that negative effect, right? And so I think a lot of this is coming down to the chloride portion of, of that potash. And so if we had ample rain or enough rain to kind of work that chloride through before that young developing seedling was taken up to, to get that injury. We never had any injury in terms of a stand loss. Uh, in some other studies we've seen as a, kind of a, a restriction in height of growth. I think that there's another one that we haven't dug up the plants, but I believe that chloride toxicity is affecting roots, which is now affecting the, uh, the nodulation. So let's go back a step here. So in that case, if it's affecting roots and nodulation, well, when we add a fertilizer that has nitrogen, so whether it's urea in this case, or over on the, the other side, the ammonium sulfate that's got nitrogen and sulfur, it's kind of overcoming the short come, shortfall in terms of the nitrogen supply from nodulation until those roots can, can generate and get past that burn, get past some of that injury, and then start developing nodules. And so I think that's where we had the, the benefit in that 2019 year and here in 2020. Again, I'm thinking that the chloride uh, wasn't an issue, um, so we didn't have the negative effect. Now, never mind. This is um, uh, my sulfur playground, if you will, and so this is where uh, we continue to see a sulfur benefit. And so, in that year, is a 13 bushel response on a field that that needed it. So this is a, a sandy, um, sandy loam, loamy sand. It's what I call black sand, about a two and a half percent organic matter soil. Um, but so then we, we stepped it up a notch. We stepped it up and so maybe we can manage this in a different way. So uh, I did a few more trials in 21 uh, where we looked at West Lafayette, so good prairie soil. 
And then we, we mix this up with varieties that either have um, this characteristic of being a chloride includer or an excluder, all right? And so when we say it's a chloride includer, it has the, it's more prone to take up the chloride and have the, the toxic effects. Whereas if it's an excluder, or the best that I could get was this intermediate, and then it doesn't take up chloride nearly as much, and so it doesn't have the negative effect or as much sensitivity to it. So another way of managing it, if you're a every year or right ahead of a soybean planting potassium kind of applicator, um, you know, we can manage this potentially by just the variety. You know, this chloride includer versus excluder, that's something that's really talked about more in the Mid-South where they deal with chloride toxicity in their irrigation water. It's not as common for us here in the Midwest, but I think this is an avenue that we can can search in terms of managing managing if we want to put out potassium, especially if you think about some of those CEC soils that are pretty low. Um, so within that, uh, in 21, we didn't have that effect. So, all right, we had enough water to move chloride through. So we had no negative or positive effects in the chloride includer or intermediate with potassium. Uh, the potassium itself didn't shoot us uh, short. We went 69 and a half bushel beans to 67. Nothing occurring there, and I need to move. I got a window that's popped up, and I can't see, so maybe I can move that out. There we go. All right. The little zoom windows in my way. All right, there we go. Uh, so within this one, uh, we didn't have the interaction, but here in the West Lafayette site, planted uh, about the May 13th, 14th, middle of May, uh, even. At West Lafayette, we were getting a, a benefit of the sulfur. So this is 68 bushel beans to 75, so seven bushel response. Uh, and then we even uh, gained a little bit more with the triple superphosphate added into it. Um, I will note that on triple superphosphate, there's probably about 2% incidental sulfur that comes with that. And then MAP and DAP are probably pretty similar, about one and a half to two and a half percent. So you do gain a little bit of sulfur from those products. So if there wasn't much of a need um, of sulfur and you've got those, you might get a, an extra push. Whereas like in our scenario, we might have gained a little extra push with, um, with the sulfur as well as, okay, cooler wet soils, add a little phosphorus uh, that can be a little limited in, in uptake and availability. And next set in Wanatow up in the Northwest part of the state, uh, we didn't have this interaction again with the variety. So the varieties themselves yielded well, um, we did not have a negative effect from the potassium, again, the chloride in particular. And so here we're, we're looking for it and we're not seeing the, the hit in terms of a yield loss, but I still caution, I had some of those early, early studies before um, in like 2016, 2015, where we were getting about three to five bushel yield hit. And so out of all the trials that I've looked at potassium over the top uh, at plant about one third of the time, one out of three times, I'm getting a three to five bushel yield hit. So just kind of be aware of that. I think the other part with it, if you're looking to mix this with sulfur to see if you have a field that's responsive to sulfur, it may just get masked. In other words, you might not have any yield difference in the untreated control strips because you had a chloride negative effect, but then you overcame that with the sulfur. So it's kind of raising awareness is all I'm doing right now and just kind of be, be mindful of that as you move forward. And so as I look at potash right now, you know, let's manage it above critical levels as much as we can ahead of the growing season. If it is low or very low ahead of soybeans, like even now or coming into uh, coming into the planting season, I would I dare say that I would want to make sure that I apply it. Even with this threat of chloride, you're going to get more benefit out of that potassium if you are low in your soils. Um, I prefer the fall. Uh, obviously this kind of becomes an issue if you have low CEC soils and they're not as uh, good at holding the potassium. And so we need to kind of work through that a little bit. Um, slight risk of injury on the chloride. If you're going to do it close to the planting, I think we do have a little bit of a higher risk of that injury. Uh, so if we're not able to pull the trigger with the weather we've had this week and you still need it, um, I dare say make sure you get a variety that is a chloride intermediate at a minimum on those fields. And then maybe even wait to apply until the beans are up or they've got a little bit better root systems uh, to go. 
maintenance applications of the potash so again yeah fall ahead of corn that's my preference and then have enough in there that uh, you don't even have to worry about the potassium ahead of soybeans with a uh, fertility application uh, if we are doing soybean fall is uh, greater than the early spring versus uh, any of the in season um let's see let's cut a chat i don't know that's something else all right that's to you guys um i'll close that down so other aspects of the sulfur story are things to be considering the sources timing uh, rate responsiveness interactions to avoid and like i said i already hit some of those with the potassium and then occasionally we see some uh, intense management synergies so uh within that you know sulfur has obviously been one that we've been low on for a number of years and starting to apply more and more and maybe you guys have already been in this situation that you've been applying it you tend to have more applications ahead of corn and then start to get into the beans but um, again some may have already been doing this anyway um, this is a little a better close-up of that same shot earlier where we had 20 pounds sulfur at planting and you've had this the screen up you've got the you see them in the least concentration you see it in branching and then you see it all the way through the season because i think one of the major gains out of this is the sulfur is needed as a cofactor for nodulation. So if we're improving nodulation, we're improving nitrogen supply, and then we're going to have darker green leaves, and we're going to hold on to those leaves longer. And so doing that, you have better seed cells. Uh, here's the same kind of shot of untreated control now is on the left in this picture, sorry, where it's September 7th, and the beans are already starting to senesce. They're not holding on to their leaves versus the treatments that has the 20 pounds of sulfur up front at planting or close to it have better leaf retention uh, more chlorophyll content you know what this does whenever we start to get the cooler part of the season the september's uh, if we get those 50 degree nights these plants are going to shut down so all of that's occurring um, but now we've got a high nitrogen content we're more apt to rebound on those cool nights or in this case it could have just been beautiful weather and we just don't have the amount of nitrogen there. So the plant is going to senesce. So as it senesces, it's not going to have as many pods being retained as well as um, seed cell. And so when I talk about this as a, a nodulation effect primarily, uh, this is what I'm talking about. So the same field where now you got 20 pounds of sulfur up front, just gob stoppers in terms of the nodules that are there uh, at the end of the season. Uh, so huge, they've got a good nitrogen supply and capacity versus off to the right, untreated control. Uh, you have very few nodules. And so it stands to reason that, you know, typically we're seeing a, a 10 to 15 bushel response in this huge scenario, right? That's not every field, but understand if we're creating scenarios that are limiting sulfur supply, uh, so those cool wet soils, limited mineralization, those are going to be fields that are probably also going to benefit from that, or at least Let's take a look at that. Um, in terms of the, the sources, there's a lot that's out there that I've been looking at over the years. So I'm, I'm just giving a couple of examples. In 20, I went to 15 pounds of sulfur, trying to weed out the, um, the top ones uh, and not just oversupplying the sulfur uh, in this. And so it was applied over the top of planting. We did balance it with urea, triple superphosphate, and potassium before I realized that we were having some of those issues. So even with the potassium that's in the mix of this, um, uh, we can get some of the, the benefit to overcome it. So in this case, we went from 51 bushel beans to 63 with ammonium sulfate, um, the MES-10, so that's half elemental sulfur, half ammonium sulfate, and then a, a nice a slug of those that are coming next. Sulfur-4, that's the pelletized gypsum. That's, that's a good source uh, as well. And then we looked at the combination of just nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium to see if there's any just nitrogen benefit. And, and really, you might say there was a, a little bit of an uptick, but I go back that I supplied phosphorus, which has incidental uh, sulfur with there. So I dare say that we probably gained uh, that yield or that perceived yield benefit uh, a little bit from that, uh, from that supply. Uh, I bring in Vincent just to get something somewhat closer to you guys. Uh, where we looked at 20 pounds of sulfur as AMS as pre-emerge versus V5, basically say, okay, do we have an opportunity to, to stretch out this application? And we also look to try to match up the nitrogen that comes from AMS to say, okay, is it a ni nitrogen benefit or not? And we use UAN pre and then urea V5. 
We didn't have an interaction on this particular study. Um, I dare say that I'd still, uh, with some of the other studies and trials uh, that I've had, I'd rather be pre-emerge uh, to the early V1, V2. I probably wouldn't really want to stretch all the way to V5, but if, um, if we we're in need of it, I'm fine with doing it, but I would still try to catch the earlier side because you've got the nodulation effect, you've got to solubilize it. If you have a nodulation effect, it takes three, four, or five weeks for those nodules to become active and fixing nitrogen. And so that's really where the benefit would come from. Um, so at this point, this particular year in 20 events, then we had an equal benefit. And so in that, we ran from 48 bushel beans. You add the AMS, we had a six bushel response on kind of more of a yellow sand, if you will, down at the Vincennes area. Um, I did back in 2016 when I started this, I had a lot of different individual treatments to, to figure out where to go. In 2016, I wasn't able to apply my AMS until V3. And in that particular year, I got a five bushel gain. So uh, again, there's some flexibility, but certainly it needs to be on the earlier side of the season if we're going to look at this. Uh, there's some people out there that that think that uh, we need it later. I just, I just think it's it's way too late to get that benefit. And by later, I mean R3, R4. Uh, we're talking the beginning pod and full pod, and it's just it's just too late at that point. Some of the considerations uh, to look at this is um, use a soluble source, right? Um, we need to start matching up if we have fields that are responsive those with um, elemental sulfur. So then we can take the time to oxidize. You know, it takes three, 400 days for that to fully become available. And so if we have this kind of overlaying a little bit of elemental sulfur, which is a cheaper source um, with some of the soluble sources in the current season, that might be a nice play. But right now, uh, most of the responsiveness that I'm going with is the soluble sources uh, pre to early vegetative stages. Um, 15 to 20 pounds of sulfur is, is really all we need in this broadcast. I don't see any reason to go higher. I've gone higher. I've had um, anecdotal you know, observations where people want 40 units of, of sulfur, and I actually think they got a, a hit. Uh, so 15 to 20 pounds is, is more than enough, but if a guy wants to do AMS at 100 pounds of product, okay, I can live with that. It's 24 pounds of sulfur, um, but I really don't think you need to go any higher than that. Medicine is, is playing well for us. Uh, pelletized gypsum, and again, when you look at fertilizer prices in particular, I'll go with AMS versus pelletized gypsum. I mean, the price difference is pretty large in, in this day and age with what we've got on fertility prices. And so if you want to play with it I, and you've got availability, the, the pelletized gypsum is, is pretty responsive. And so I'm fine with running that route over an AMS, um, but AMS is still a good product. Uh, HS ammonium thiosulfate, I've got kind of a mixed bag results. I think uh, we do decent, but uh, if we're going to do it, make sure we do it before the beans are up. I don't want to cause any injury or the potential. And then if you want to take samples to see if you have a need, uh, you have these snapshots shots of taking leaf samples. So you're close, close to critical levels uh, in the tissue sample, so 0.25% or a nitrogen to sulfur ratio for an 18 to 1 or higher. That's going to be a field that's probably going to be responsive. That you have an imbalance in terms of the nitrogen and sulfur. And so applying the sulfur would help bring it into balance as an improved protein production. Uh, I made this point already, but again, we could have some nutrient interaction that mask any of the benefit, in particular, I'm talking about potash. Um, timely planting is still foundational for high yielding beans, no, no matter what. And then there's some opportunities to, to intensify that with some of the nitrogen and sulfur treatment. So this is kind of a, a precursor to the next few slides I've got coming up, as well as this overall, what's affecting our availability. So we've got uh, sulfur that's uh, deficient year in, year out, like I've got up in lacrosse on what I call my sandbox, my, my sulfur playground. But also, are we creating uh, sulfur deficiencies or maybe a better way of putting a sulfur responsiveness with uh, some earlier plantings or high residue or, or even cover crops. So that's where I want to lead into. So the sulfur and nitrogen, you know, you got to have the both of these and really clicking on all cylinders to have high yielding beans. And so sulfur, uh, hopefully you have that appreciation is needed as a cofactor for nodulation. We get the sulfur from the atmosphere, not as much as we used to. You get it from the soil. So if you have high organic matter, mineralization, good supply, um, lower organic matter, 
pore supply. So again, that's why those coarse texture soils, low organic matter tend to be, those are the first sulfur responders. But I'm gonna show you some data with this, with planting data effects on, on good prairie dirt that's causing some pretty remarkable responses. So I'm talking three, four and a half uh, percent sulfur, or three to four percent organic matter. So if we plant timely, what we're doing is uh, accumulate heat units and light interception. So then we can have this nice compact plant that has more nodes than a later planted crop, uh, has that reproductive uh, duration that's longer, so we have better seed fill. So ultimately we have better yield. But a lot of times, so I'm talking late April, early May, you're in the woods. If you're not on river bottoms, you can probably be pushing this um, earlier April, mid-April to, to even early April. And so um, in those scenarios, we're gonna also be creating these limited opportunities for mineralization. So that turnover of the organic matter. So here's a case um, back up to West Lafayette side where Early uh, for this 2018 year was May 11th versus late. And in that, uh, what was our response to some sulfur treatments? And we had nitrogen out there. I really just want to concentrate on these upper four where you have the entry control, AMS pre emerged, so that's 20 pounds of sulfur. You get 17 and a half pounds of nitrogen. ATS, that's getting sprayed on here right, right before emergence, 20 pounds. And then we even kind of blend a little bit of urea and 10 pounds of sulfur. So in looking at that, one of the major things that, that jumps out to this is, let me get my laser going, is that you know, May 11 plant, 62 bushel beans, uh, nothing huge by any means, uh, but then we add in this ATS or AMS in urea, we're, we're at a 12 bushel response. If we add in uh, just the AMS, a seven bushel response, so a seven to 10 bushel response on a prairie soil that by all rights should not see a response to sulfur. Now, when you go to the first week of June, there's not a not a lick of difference between any of those. Again, given us the, the strong indication that we've got limited mineralization, limited turnover of the sulfur as well as the nitrogen, probably more sulfur um, versus the first week of June. Okay, plants are growing quickly as well as microbial activity and turnover is very quick. And so there's not much in terms of the yield benefit. There's in fact none from those sulfur treatments in that year. 2020, I wanna draw your attention to, I changed out a few of the, the more convoluted treatments on this study and added in palletized gypsum that pre-emerged 10 pounds and 20 pounds. And so within that, um, I wanted to kind of compare just a straight sulfur supply without a nitrogen side of it. Obviously, uh, with gypsum, we get it's calcium sulfate, so we get calcium. I didn't do any balancing for that, but just really want to say, okay, in particular, you have 20 pounds of sulfur from gypsum versus 20 pounds from AMS or 20 pounds from ATS, but those come with a nitrogen supply as well. What's the benefit? So in 2020, um, uh, great yielding year. So our first planting date in that year was May 12th. So we just don't have good tile drainage on these fields, unfortunately. So I'm not, I'm not even pushing planting days as early as I want. Uh, we run 62 bushel beans uh, planted in May on treated control. First week of June was 62 bushel beans. We didn't gain anything. You know, I just got done talking about gaining 10 bushel on that particular year. We didn't gain anything from a planting date. However, this interaction with sulfur and nutrient supplies is, is just flat out remarkable. And so we go from 62 bushel beans to 80 bushel beans when we add in this one treatment. Again, not saying that's every field, but uh, amazing that kind of response. So 18 bushel response. Do we get anything out of this combination with the later planting? No, again, that story is still the same. We're not getting any benefit there. Uh, you add in um, uh, the 40 pounds of nitrogen and 10 pounds of sulfur, 83 bushel beans, uh, pretty remarkable. And now uh, that pelletized gypsum, 75, 76 bushel beans, so a, a 13 to 14 bushel response. So the vast majority, to kind of answer the question, is the sulfur benefit or is the nitrogen benefit? The vast majority of that benefit is the sulfur, which I believe is affecting nodulation and fixation, more so than any of this nitrogen that we get from the fertilizer. You might have a slight argument that you think there's a few ticks of a bush, a few bushels from that nitrogen from whether it's AMS or ATS or AMS and urea, 
Um, but when you want to look at the line share, it's coming from sulfur. So within that, what interactions do we have to play out here? Early planting still proves to increase yield. That's, that's really um, a foundation for high yielding beans. Now, when we add in fertility, I'm starting to look at this across the state to see if this is going to hold true at every location that's early planting or cool wet soils. Um, but in 2018, 2019, we saw a 10 plus bushel response with those. What's interesting also is that our protein concentrations are either maintaining or increasing with these applications as, as well as the yield gain. So that's pretty, pretty good thing to see. A lot of times when we have a yield increase, uh, we have a, a protein decrease because it costs the plant so much energy to per, uh, create that protein. If it gets diverted to more dry matter production, a yield, then um, then we have greater yield but lower protein. Well, in this case, we actually have both. And so that's, that's a nice thing to see. Very rare to see actually. Late planted beans, just we don't see it. 2018, I didn't show 2019 because the planting date study was uh, first, uh, second week of June versus the last week of June. They're both late planted and we did not see the benefit. 2020 late planted did not see the benefit either. Uh, so uh, to, to beat the dead horse here, I think if we have conditions that are causing it be, you're cool and wet during that early growth of soybeans, uh, and also in particular, the, the mineralization, the turnover of sulfur and nitrogen from the soil, because that's where we're getting that early sulfur and nitrogen, why the plants are starting to develop. I think those are going to be key to be looking at the sulfur response. So again, early plantings in this case, I've got data that uh, we look at some cover crops and maybe even some high residue would come into the play. I want to uh, wrap up on one point on seed rate and, and see if there's questions. So again, the idea, and kind of been a lot of sulfur talk, been a lot of nutrient, but I want to go back to the seed rate thing. Um, there's been a number of folks that have been looking at ultra early plantings and ultra low um, plant populations. And, and I've done on my rate response in terms of seed rates, we go from 50,000 increments. So 50, 100, 200, excuse me, 50, 100, 150, 200, 250,000 seeds per acre. And I, I've seen, I was just at the Commodity Classic last week, a lot of people are saying, well, let's just be planting at 50,000 or 30,000 plants. And beans will branch, they'll adapt, no doubt. Um, but um, I, I definitely have those plots, those trials have no difference between 50,000 plants to 250. I've also got those that tail off, and so I'm still I'm still of the mind if we're shooting for a stand around that 100,000 plants, 120. Uh, if you want a little bit of cushion, it's going to be more than adequate. I don't think it's causing us to go off the deep end and actually lose yield. Uh, and so when I look at seed rate recommendations, we're at that 120, 140 for a planter. Air seeder maybe not as good of a job in terms of seed depth control as well as down the row. So I'm gonna increase that to 140, 160 drills, um, 160 to 180. Again, it's, it's the equipment that you see that to get to the 100,000 or 120,000 plants. And and again, there's cushion built into that. I, I, I've got data that we're just been looking at. It's, it's around 90,000 plants, really, we're still fine. Most people don't wanna hear that number, but um, just to bring that out. Uh, if we're really fine-tuned with our equipment and field conditions, I think we can lower those seeding rates. If you bring in a fungicide seed treatment in particular, think about some of those seedling diseases, I think we can, can drop that seeding rate a little bit more. Uh, in most cases, uh, in terms of just profitability, I, I don't see the need of putting an insecticide in there. So if you're able to drop that out of there that leaves the fungicide, I think that's a, a good opportunity for us. So with that, uh, variety selection is still going to be a top, 6 to 12 bushel swing, row speed spacing. Uh, we gain that on the narrow rows and even more with intense management. And then uh, stands, let's stay around that 100,000 mark and timely planting. And what can we do to get a good stand established and access that nutrition? So with that, I will entertain any questions.